Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Hi. So I'm here um, as the first half of this session. Um, and just for a little bit of continuity's sake, um, I will be changing my name to Mad David Blank Edelman for the duration of this sort of thing, just so when Mad Dog shows up, we'll be, we'll be in good shape. So, um, OK, you probably don't know this, but the word copacetic is one of the words in the English language that we don't actually know where it comes from. It's one of the ones where, whose etymology is just unknown. There's some theories that are out there. There are theories that say that um, it comes from the Yiddish, or, or the Hebrew, rather, kobeseter, or ko, which means all in order, or kobetzedek, which means all, in, all with justice. Um, but, oh, or, you know, there's some notion there's Creole, which there's a Creole word that's similar, but nobody really knows. Now, for me, the origin of, of copacetic comes from this man right here. This was my grandfather, Sidney Brightman, who died when I was in college um, and was a really fine gentleman. So as far as I'm concerned, that's where the word copacetic came from. And if, and if you haven't heard copacetic before, um, it means, you know, everything is okay. Everything is going well. Everything is good. Um, and I just like that word a lot. And in case you were just curious, this is what I look like uh, when, when that previous picture was taken. So uh, I have changed a little bit, but not a lot, really. OK, so why am I here? So let me tell you a short story. So prior to the last position um, I was trying to hire for, and by the way, I am in fact hiring right now. So if you like this talk and want to work for me, you have the opportunity. Um, I was doing some hiring, and I was trying to talk to these folks about, you know, who were coming in to get a job with me, about what the possibilities, you know, what, what they knew, what they, what they used at work. Did they understand best practices? Did they understand the sort of stuff that we talk about here at Lisa? And so, you know, I, so I, I get introduced to people. Let's call this person Bob, for lack of a better name. So Bob came and interviewed with me, and I started talking with him about you know, best practices and configuration management and all the sort of stuff that you'd expect. You know, I don't even know if DevOps crossed my lips, but you could guess it might have. And the more I talked to Bob, who really, 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 really wanted the job, the more I talked to Bob, the sadder Bob got. Because I kept on hearing things like, oh, we'd do that if we could. You know, we don't, we don't have time for this. My boss doesn't let me. Um, this sounds great. I'd love to be able to do this sort of thing. I'd love to be able to do the right thing. But you know, we're fighting fires and stuff like that. And you know, by the time I'm done talking to him, he's sobbing or the the equivalent thereof. And so I thought, oh, this is you know, maybe maybe I just found somebody who has pretty emotional about this stuff, or or at least felt this way. But then I started interviewing, and so you know, I interviewed Sally, and we had the same discussion. And lo and behold, Sally says, "I'm so sad about this. You know, like like I wish I could do it. I just wish I could this. I wish I could have this 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 fun at work. I wish I could be that at work." And you know, and then I kept you know I kept on encountering these people. And quite frankly, at that time point in time, I realized, okay, guess what? We're all bozos on the same bus, you know. <laughs> And really, what we need to do, you know, so, so it, really, it really bothered me. You know, I've been in the system and community for some 26 odd years now. I really wanted to see, is there something I could do to help these people? And I had that in the back of my head for a while. And so this talk is a direct result of that experience. Because I wanted to see if I could help. So let me, let me ask the, the following question. So I have these theories about why you guys are all in this room. And I, and I appreciate the fact that you're here with me now. Um, I have this theory that maybe some of you are unhappy at work. You know, maybe not. Maybe some. Maybe you know somebody who's unhappy at work. You know, in the system, in, in the system and community. Maybe you're, you are personally making somebody unhappy at work. Maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe you are a manager, and and you see your employees, and you wish your employees were happier, or you want to make sure that your employees are happy. Or Mad Dog has an open act. You decided he's going to say something cool. I might as well just hang out here and take a little carb carb crash nap ahead of time. You know, and I'm I'm cool with that too. Or you know, maybe none of the above. But maybe that's the case. So the goal of this talk is to see if I can give you some ideas based on some of the research I've done. And it's not original research per se. It's just doing a lot and a lot of reading and trying to follow the streams of everything I could that would help with us to see if I could figure out ways to make you, as sysadmins, just a little bit happier at work, essentially, and perhaps in your lives as well. So when I show you this picture, OK, how many people in this room, can you see what this picture is? OK, this is a picture of a bunch of plugs, and they've got the, the little bread, the closing label thingies that are on them that are, holding, that are labeling the cables. When I show you this picture, how many of this room get just a little bit happier? <laughs> yeah, OK, right? Right, because, OK, and why? Does anybody want to say why this makes you a little bit happier? Because we're OCD. Yeah, that's good. What else? What else makes this happy? What? I had bread. You had bread. <laughs> It's just so tricky when you get a, when an audience like this. OK, well, OK, I'll give you another similar one. This is a little harder to see, I guess, as well. This is using alligator clips to, at the edge of your desks to keep stuff. 
Okay, is that also making you happy? Maybe you've seen these, maybe you haven't. My experience is, is when I see stuff like this, I personally, and by the way, come on in, there's plenty of room. In fact, you can sit right in front of me if you want. Come on in, come on right in. It'll be just like, you know, George Bush, and anyway, let's not talk about that. Um, come on in, come on in, please. So uh, this makes me a little bit happier. I get a little bit of joy in my life when I see this. And so let me tell you where I'm going to go in this talk, just so you have some idea. There, there, there are a few ways, I think, things to look at, and they all begin with M, because M is a good, a good thing to say, that I think um, can help you understand the nature of happiness and happiness in work as a system. They have to do with mindsets, motivation, and making change. And that sounds a little forced, but really those are the M's that came out. OK, so let's talk about mindsets. There is a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous researcher by the name of Carol Dweck. If you've not heard of Carol Dweck, you should. I think she's at Stanford right now. I'm not sure. I've not actually spoken to her personally. She, she does a lot of speaking. She does a lot of writing. And really, she does some phenomenal, phenomenal um, experiments with kids and with adults about motivation and, how, and, and, and also about how do people uh, live, how do they have success in life in the world. She does some fabulous stuff. Um, and if you have a child, you should, if uh, not read this book, you should at least go to her website and go look at her New Yorker articles about how to talk to kids so that they grow up in a way that will suit them later. She's got some fabulous stuff. And the, the more, so what I did is I, I read all these books, and I, I went back and I went chasing their, their experiments, and I went chasing the papers they, 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 they published. And she was one of the people that really blew me away. And she says such a simple thing, and then later on I realized this is like an earworm or, an, or a mind worm. It has burrowed into my brain, and now I think about things in this way. And it's going to sound really simple when you start, but I guarantee you, the more you read about what she's done and the more you hear about what she's thinking about, I think the more it will take over your brain the way you think about it. So she basically says, well, let's tell you what, let's do a quick quiz. This, is, this, this will help you understand the point. So here's a quick quiz. What I need you to do, and you don't have to shout this out or write it down, and we don't have a lot of time, so we can't even tally, tally this. That would be kind of fun to do this on a web form or something. I'm going to give you a bunch of statements. Please tell me in your own head, without speaking it if you can, um, whether you strongly agree or disagree with the following statements. And there will be eight of them total. Four of them will mirror the other four. Okay? Number one, your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't change very much. Two, you can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. Three, no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change quite a bit. And four, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. Okay? So that's the first step. Clearly about intelligence, right? Hopefully you got that. Um, that's part of this. Okay, now let's, let's do it a little more broadly. You are a certain kind of person, and there's not much that can be done to really change that. And this is, again, I want you to be thinking about this for your own head. No matter what kind of person you are, you can always change substantially. You can do things differently, but the important parts of who you are really can't be changed. And you can always change basic things about the kind of person you are. So Carol Dweck asserts that depending on how you answer this, and clearly on each of these statements, you're going to say you're going to be more strongly or agree or disagree. You can sort of lump people into two separate kinds of mindsets. This is what she talks about. These two separate these mindsets. Okay. Oh, and this is the other random question that she asked later. Um, you know, when do you feel smart? When you feel when when you're when you're flawless or when you're learning? Okay. It's just a fundamental a fundamental question to ask yourself, and it turns out to be a really good hard question. OK, so the two kind of mindsets that she suggests people have are fixed and growth mindsets. OK? And she divides the world like this. And I used to think this is you know, two things. This must be boring. Well, you know, how could you, possibly, how could you pop possibly characterize people? But the more you read about the research she does with, with five-year-olds, and I'll tell you about some of those later if you want to hear about it, um, uh, the more you realize that, oh, yeah, this is really going on. So fixed, the fixed mindset says that traits are just givens. OK, you got what you got. That's what you're going to get. You're, you're born. You're going to die with it. That's the deal. And the qualities that you have, who you are fundamentally as a person, are carved in stone. Don't expect to change at all. The growth mindset says sort of the opposite, which suggests that your basic qualities are things that you can change over time through your efforts, through your, through your actions, and through what you do, and that you know, everyone can change and grow through application and experience. Okay? Now, which side do you fall on is an interesting question, and it's worthwhile thinking about this. She has an opinion. You'll see there's a little bit of judgmental as to which is better, um, and here's what she suggests about the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. Okay? The, the results of a fixed mindset. If you have a fixed mindset, her assertion is that every situation calls for confirmation. People who have, a, who have, have one calls for confirmation of their intelligence, personality, or character. Every single one, every situation requires some sort of confirmation for that. 
because you get this amount, you know, are, you, better have, you better truly be what you think you are. Okay? And the other thing that also goes on is that every situation gets evaluated in this person's head, whether you know it or not. And I have some of this too, right? So I wanna, I'm, I'm not speaking like I know what you're, when I'm not speaking to you as anybody but somebody who could be sitting in one of those seats too. You know, every situation is evaluated. Will I succeed or fail? Will I look smart or dumb? Will I, will I be accepted or rejected? And the tricky thing about a fixed mindset, however, is because of this sort of stuff, in order for you to be happy, you kind of require this diet of easy successes, right? It can't, be the case that, it can't be the case that you can have failures because a failure might actually you know, indicate that you, aren't, you don't have as much as you think you have. Okay? So here's the key thing I want to say about mindsets. This is by my, I think this is, this is, I put it on this own slide because I think it's, it's earth shattering, uh, but only maybe late, only to me. Maybe I'm just the only one who, who there is. So depending on which of these two mindsets you have, it changes the fundamental meaning of every one of your failures in life and, every, and all of your effort. If in fact you fail and you have a fixed mindset, that's a problem. That's a real problem because you've now, you know, now you 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 have you have, uh, uh, you, have a, uh, you have to deal with this confrontation that goes on. Um, and if you um, make a lot of effort towards something, um, you know, if you if you already think that you you have a fixed mindset, I'm a smart person. Well, you don't have to apply much effort to it. You're a smart person. Why should you expend more effort towards it? So a lot of stuff gets filtered through this. Okay? And it gets interesting for a couple of things. It gets interesting for you, it gets interesting for your kids, it gets interesting for your organization. And by that, I mean that, you know, uh, here's the thing. Uh, my theory, and this is, this is um, from uh, a book about uh, why failure is good that, that I have at the, at the end of these slides, you can see, that suggests that organizations need to make mistakes. They don't make mistakes, they can't improve. And, uh, but the problem is, is that most organizations, the one you and I work for, do their best not to make any mistakes. Like that's clearly, that's clearly a value in many organizations. Don't ever make a mistake. But if you never make a mistake, you can't really learn anything from it. And in fact, um, John Dewey, one of the, who was uh, one of the premier educational reform kind of people, he's not this person who you think he is. You, he's not Melville, he's not Melville uh, Dewey who did the Dewey Decimal System. He's this guy uh, who's John Dewey who did a bunch of stuff about educational reform and was pretty cool in his own right. said, all learning begins when our comfortable ideas turn out to be inadequate. That's when the learning takes place. Um, and you know the thing is, is that much experimentation has, done, has been done, and I could cite some experiments if you want to hear it, that basically show that people learn better when they're told to just learn and it's okay to make mistakes. People that are told you must do well on this, don't do as well. So the way it works is if you do, if you do, the, if you do an experiment, what, what you'll find is, is, is that people who are told do the right thing the first time and just be good at what you do will initially have better performance, but then it will drop off. They will not learn the material nearly as well. They will not be able to hand, handle further complex situations like that versus the other people that are told, oh, go make some mistakes. They will initially make more mistakes, but later on, you'll find that they tend to get it better. And here's, uh, you know, there are in, in fact business consultants who are now telling people, you should as a company go make deliberate mistakes. Things you know will fail because you will get something from that. And it's the way to innovation. And here's an example that I really, really dug. So um, James Stiegler, I think is at UMich, he um, was doing some research on the difference between English and Japanese uh, math mathematics teaching. And he translated one of the mathematics textbooks for kids, uh, for the Japanese, and in it, they're talking about fractions and adding fractions. And in it, it says, and I, I can't, I'm going to be paraphrasing it, in it, it basically says, um, when your kids are, and this is the teacher's edition, when your kids are learning to add fractions, they will make the following mistake. They will start to add the denominators. Do not correct them. Whatever you do, do not correct them. Let them make this mistake. Because if you correct them, they will stop making the mistake. But if you don't correct them, and later on, they get to see why that doesn't work, they will far better learn what you're trying to teach them than if you just say, here it is, here, here it is at the end. Okay, so the ultimate question comes up about this, can you change your mindset? Like, let's say you, let's say you don't dig what you're in. And she says yes, and this is on her website, which I recommend you go to, Mindset Online, um, you know, uh, and check it out. She's, in fact, got this quiz up there uh, and that, that I showed you before. Um, and she says, here's the way you do it, in her opinion. And this is done, bear, born out through experimentation. She's got all these really great experiments, especially with kids, um, that says, step one, learn to hear when you are saying in your own head things that indicate a fixed mindset. Okay. When you say to yourself, oh, I couldn't possibly do this well, or I'm not smart enough, or anything like that. Learn when, you, learn when you're limiting, limiting yourself, and you have that in your head. 
recognize that you have a choice at that moment and that you can act differently. Talk back to yourself. I know this sounds kind of weird and I don't know what, but talk back to yourself in your own head. I guess the, the term is, is it, it's, okay to, uh, it's okay to talk to yourself as long as you don't respond, I guess is, is the understanding. But um, talk back to yourself with a growth mindset and say, you know, you know, you know in order for me to get better at this, I gotta get it wrong sometimes. You know, in order for me to learn how to stay really I gotta get it wrong sometimes. Um, and then try to take the right thing towards a growth mindset. That's her suggestion. Okay, so that's mindset. So let's move that aside and go to the next thing I want to talk about, which is, and I want to make sure, yeah, we're in great time. Motivation. Okay, so for motivation, I encountered this book. And I'm sorry to show you covers of books that look like business books maybe you would never pick up in a million years. But Daniel Pink is really cool, and this is another book that you should consider purchasing if you're, if you're in, the, in, the, in the airport and you need a book to read. Um, he is a cognitive scientist, has done some really fabulous stuff around how, what makes people go, what makes them happy, and what makes them do stuff at work. And so I'm going to tell you about some of that. Um, but I'm not going to be able to do him justice, so you want to read what, what he has to say. Um, so he tries to point out, first off, there is extrinsic and intrinsic motivations, right? There's the things that come from, from outside of you and your own in intrinsic motivations to do stuff, to be happy. Come on in, there's plenty of room. Come on, come on. Come on. Um, so, um, and I'm not going to say a lot about that, except you kind of know that. And, and I'm going to talk about how intrinsic impinges, impinges on intrinsic uh, sort of stuff. But I'm not going to go too much there. The thing I will point out that might be kind of interesting to you um, as a side on, on an extrinsic stuff is I want to talk about hedonic uh, adaptation or hedonic adaptation. Now, I know when you, th you hear hedonic adaptation, you think something like uh, boys or girls gone wild or even sysadmins gone wild. Um, uh, yeah, I know. And in fact, what you can't see is you can't see, actually, it's Josh right there on the bottom left showing other people his stuff on his laptop. So there, there it is, exactly. It's, it's just some stuff. This is, hedonic, this is kind of where hedonic uh, uh, adaptation goes on. So what hedonic adaptation is, is it's the facet of human beings where positive and negative associations and emotions and feelings and stuff like that quickly fade from new experiences. Okay, so um, let me ask you this question. How many people here, well, let me, actually, let me phrase it this way. Last time you got a new machine, be it your laptop or be it the server that you use all day long, how long did it take you before that new thing didn't seem nearly as shiny or, let's just put it this way, didn't seem fast anymore? Wasn't, didn't seem fast, you didn't notice it was fast anymore. So let's try this. How many people uh, took a week to add it to it. How about a month? Yeah, I bet more towards a month. A couple of months? Three months? Four months? Six? Is there anybody in the room who did not have the experience that said, that said every time you came to that thing that you purchased six months ago, came to and said, wow, this is still really fast. Wow, this is so really cool, right? Well, that's good. I'm glad you had that experience. And it's, it's, it's good that, that there is a person here. And that's, um, yeah, it's reminding me, it's reminding me of the, uh, my, so my father used to be a, uh, a head of, of the Alzheimer's Association in Rhode Island. And they used to have a joke that said, the cool thing about Alzheimer's is you're always meeting new people. Um, <laughs> and I know, sorry, but that's, I'm just taking it from them. Anyway, so anyway, so I, so I think that's kind of, you know, so I appreciate that you have the ability not to, not, to be, uh, not to deal with this, but I think that's what happens with people with extrinsic rewards, okay? So that's the thing I want to point out to you, right? So if you're trying to motivate yourself or to motivate, motivate someone else and you try to use extrinsic rewards, you run up against hedonic ad adaptation really quickly. Right? And all of a sudden, the cool thing that you just gave them, the raise you just gave them, and all this sort of stuff, starts to become less, less useful. So if you want to know how to immediately nuke your intrinsic motivation, your internal drive to do something, okay? and this is what we're really talking about here in this talk, is your internal drive to be something, to do something, and that sort of stuff, here are ways to do it. Step number one, uh, and I want to be clear about this before I, before I tell you the steps or, or what, what I'm saying about this. Um, there are two types of tasks that, that Daniel Pink uh, identifies. There's the heuristic task, which is, you know, I do this thing step by step. I have my step, and there it is. I'm sorry. Yeah, this, sorry, wrong, I'm, I'm reversing them. There's the algorithmic task, which says, here's a set of steps. You do the set of steps. You repeat the set of steps n times, right? And we all do that, where congratulations, you have to go stuff a mailing or something. That's the example they give. Okay. And then there's a heuristic task, which I think is the one that our world is, so that's why we're going to talk mostly about heuristic world tasks, where congratulations, go and do something. Here's your task. You must go do it. I'm not telling you the steps. You get to figure it out. And the vast majority of your day is probably more of that than the I'm just going to do this rote set of steps. So the first kind, the algorithmic kind, doesn't really have a lot of intrinsic motivation. 
right? It's not the case that you go, woohoo, I get to, you know, I get to restuff the envelope into the, uh, maybe you do, maybe that person in the audience does still. But, but uh, you know, whoopee, I get to stuff it in again and put the, and put the stamp on it again. Whoopee, I get to stuff it in and put a stamp. You know, there's not a lot of intrinsic motivation about that. So you can't really dampen it. You can't really nuke it very much. You can incent it by giving people money for doing it. But that's okay because you're not really nuking something internal in them. They just have to do it. They know it. It's, an, it's, an, it's, it's basically coming from outside. But here's the way, the best way you can, if you want to nuke somebody's intrinsic motivation. You can do a few things. First things you can do is you can offer higher incentives. First, you can, first thing you can do is say, okay, what I'm gonna do is pay you a lot more money. Okay? And then, or, you know, especially if you're talking if-then rewards, you get this project done and you're gonna get a raise. And then it happens again, you get this project again, I'm gonna give you a bonus. Okay, you just you know, if thens do it right away because then it all becomes about the bonus, and then it becomes about the money, and not about the task. Um, and also, you know, rewards like this narrow our focus. Instead of thinking about how do we improve what we're doing, it's all about getting to X, getting to the external award. Okay, and there's just lots and lots of research about this. And it turns out that you know, in terms of pay and stuff like that, pay is good to give somebody a fair basis so they don't have to they can worry about other things, but paying people more, like they've done all these great research where, where they pay people more to do a task and they get so, and they say, if you get this task done, I'll pay you twice as much. And what, fi hi, fi what winds up happening is people wind up doing it twice as poorly or slowly or they make more mistakes because they're all, uh, about, I must get this done. And so it has a negative effect. Um, the other thing that people have also tried, and I hope it doesn't happen in your place, is sort of disciplinary measures <laughs> using sticks. And the, the example that I thought was so cool, um, there was, a, there was a, an experiment that was done at an Israeli daycare center. The Israeli daycare center was having this problem where kids were being picked up late by their parents. Okay? And if you were, like myself, a parent, and you know, you, know, you know that problem. But they were having this problem, so they said, okay, tell you what, we're going to do this experiment, and we're going we're to make it so every time you pick up your kid late, we're going to fine you N shekels. I think it was about three bucks in, in U.S. dollars at that time. Now... They do this, they institute the pro program. Would you care to guess what happened? Say what? Say what? It got worse. That's right. Right. And people got, pe that's right. It got worse. People got, people started paying and it became, okay, now I can exchange the, mo now I can just give you money and that goes away. It got twice as worse, in fact. They have twice as many kids staying late. Okay? So, so just finding somebody doesn't always work. Okay? Okay, so here's what Daniel Pink thinks are the components of, um, of getting back your, and dealing with your own intrinsic motivation. First off, you have to have some level of autonomy. And he points out it's not independence. It's not, uh, he, think he, he says, it's not like the Marlboro Man. You're not like off on a plane. It's not, not suggesting in order to, to have intrinsic motivation, you have to be alone by yourself on the plane, just you and your, and your horse, or maybe not even your horse, um, doing the work. Right? It's not that. It has, you, know, you can be totally dependent on other people. It doesn't matter about independence. It's autonomy. And he, says, he, he also makes a really nice cutting remark about empower, empowerment. He can't stand the term empowerment. And I can't stand it either. Now, I didn't realize until he said it this way. He said, it's not, the problem with empowerment is it makes it sound like the company or whoever you're working for has all the power and they're ladling it out to you. You know, you, oh, you grateful, oh, you grateful worker. Um, you know, from their, from their power. That's not what they're talking about there. The question is, can you, in your, in your job and in your life, act with choice? And here are the, the four factors he thinks you need to be able to, to have some control of to do that or to have. The ability to act with choice about the task that you're doing and maybe the order and, what, and how it's going to be done. Time, how long it's going to take to a certain extent or how your time, how your time is going to be scheduled. There's some lovely, lovely research about how miserable are lawyers Okay, who often get a chance to choose what they, who often don't get a chance to choose just what they have to do and at what time. And they, they have the, 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 that's one of the things that most lawyers don't have the ability to do, is choose what they're going to do. Congratulations, you're billing for this hour, this is what you're working on. Technique, how you're going to do something, and ideally, can you pick the team, who you're going to work with. Now, I recognize when I say this that it's not the case that tomorrow you're going to walk into, into your office and go, guess what, I want all this. And you're going to, and you could say it, I suppose, and you might get it, but I somehow doubt it. Um, but keeping this in mind as you think about what you need to be happy, I think, is useful. Similarly, part number two, he suggests, is you need some sense of mastery. And mastery comes from, first off, pain, right? I mean, just to be serious about this, right? If you want to get good at something, you have to be able to put the time in and the effort in and stuff that isn't going to be pleasant, okay? He suggests that, that mastery is asymptotic. 
you know, you want to get good, you want to get good, but, you, but the thing is, is that the better you get, you know, the, the closer you get to really, really, really fabulous, but you never get there. And, and there's this lovely saying from Pirkei Avot, one of, one of the uh, Ethics of Our Fathers, it's, a, it's a, one of the Jewish texts, that talks about, you know, you're not free, you know, you, you, you know, you're not, you are, let me see if I get it, I want to make sure I say it right. Um, you're, you know, you have the, I want to get, I want to get precise later, and, I, and it's failing me. The, the, you have a job, you, you know, you have a task, and you are, you know, you are, you are in, you must, you know, you, it's up to you to go strive for perfection, but you don't have the ability to stop doing that. Like, you will never reach perfection, but neither are you given the, are, neither are you uh, let, um, let loose from having to go strive for perfection. And that's what it's like, you know. The pe those of us who've been doing the system and stuff for a long time, I want to get better, and the better I get, the better I want to get, and it's asymptotic there, right? Um, and the other thing that he talks about is flow. And flow, you may have heard of, how many people have heard of flow in this room? Okay, well that means that all of you can tell me how to say his name. Go ahead. <laughs> Check me high. Yes, that's exactly right. Well done. <laughs> so he is a, a fabulous, fabulous researcher who was way ahead of his time. He's still alive. And, um, talking about that situation where you are in the moment where everything is going right for you. The task you're doing is exactly the right level of hard for you and you're making progress on it. You are paying attention to it. It is using all your, it is using all your brain power and you are feeling good about it. Um, and you're, you're showing your mastery and all sorts sort of stuff. And that's one of the things that people need. And it turns out in his research, the times that people feel flow most often is at work. Not any other time, but at work. So work is, could, is and could be a vehicle for this for you. So I think it's worthwhile to do that. And you know, if you're not, and so the thing is, is that the tricky thing is, is that flow is that interesting balance where if something is too hard, you get really anxious about it. But if it's too not hard, it becomes really boring. So it's sort of that middle ground. OK. And the last thing he suggests, and I'm leaving this as a blank slide intentionally, um, he being Daniel Pink, um, suggests that you need as part of uh, motivation for that internal drive is a sense of purpose, working towards a higher purpose of some sort or a larger purpose. And I, I left this blank because I want to make sure that I'm not saying things that, that sound pseudo-spiritual or pseudo-religious or sound even perfectly spiritual or religious or even within a company like you're working towards a build a bigger thing. But that's ultimately, quite frankly, the sort of thing, working to something bigger than yourself and having a purpose to what you're doing is crucial. Okay. So now, as we get down here, I want to talk about how you can make a change. Because, I mean, I, I can lay this all this stuff on you, and um, I want to just set, suggest a few things that may be useful. Because I can't fix your life. I can't even fix my life. And my, my spouse can attest to that. Um, <laughs> but I can maybe give you a couple of things that get you thinking about what you need to think about to know where, where, are, the things, you know, where are the things in your life you can put a little pressure on that might help, or you can make some change. And I'm going to do that using um, sort of this incredible, does that, so I, did, I didn't know if this was going to work on a larger screen. Is, is that moving for anybody? Okay, well, there it is. Okay, well, you move your head around then. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the reason what I want to say is that I want to sort of talk about sort of the outside stuff, and then I'm going to talk about you and your internal state. Okay, so the first question is, and, and I'm doing this sort of almost concentrically because it's a lot harder to do this part, and I'm showing you the stuff that, take, that, that you have the least power to do, and then I'm moving slowly into your life, okay? Closer to where you actually have the power. Because changing your whole organization or changing the organization around you, a lot harder, you don't have a lot of power, so it's a little tricky, but there's still things you can do. And here's the thing that, that I've learned, and I've learned um, having a spouse who's a therapist. One of the things that therapists will tell you is, if, especially family therapists, is that if there is a, if there is a situation and, uh, that, that is constructed of a system, you know, there are these players, and this is, this is the system that exists, if you change one part of the system, that will indeed be the key thing. You must, all you have to do is change one part of the system, and then the system may try to re, re, you know, revert back to get homeo, in a homeostasis sort of thing. But really, that's the thing, is you don't have to have change everything, but you might be able to just change one part. And if we want to talk about the three things we talked about before, places you can change them, well, one of the things that stuck out of my mind when I was reading this sort of stuff is, if you are having problems with autonomy in your job, see if you can negotiate for a whole project. Not a part of a project, but see, even if it's a small one, try to get a whole project, whatever it is. And that will set you up for something that will allow you to have more autonomy than perhaps you've had before. Even with a micromanager, see if you can negotiate with that. For mastery, here's the thing, and this is a strictly system thing that I have noticed. Um, 
with the land of virtual machines, it is very possible to, to get a world that is not your workplace that you can break, that you can, do, that you can have failures in. That, you can, that no one's going to scream at you about, okay? Either using Vagrant, you know, which we were talked about before, which is a very cool way to spin up stuff, or EC2 or something like that, or Rackspace or someone, on, someone like that, some cloud provider. Recently, I had an issue where I was trying to fix something and code up some new stuff having to do with WordPress. And I was doing it, and because it wasn't a work thing, I was doing it on my own time. I was like, okay, well, this seems like a good place, time to learn EC2. I wanted to play with it some more. So I went and got an EC2 instance, and I spent five hours um, working through, oh God, I hate PHP, but working through, uh, and I, I can say that publicly, the, you know, my issue and learning what I needed to, and by the end I felt pretty good about it. Five hours later I'm done, I shut down my instance, and then later on I get a bill from Amazon for 15 cents. <laughs> right? And so the thing is, at these sort of prices, if there's something you want to learn or something you want to, to want to become an expert at, you have the opportunity to do that now. You really do in your own time. I understand that, that you know, like, like uh, you know, I talked to a cook recently about, uh, you know, does she like cooking at home? And she said, no, it's like postmen, like, you know, like a po you know, postal carriers. We don't like to take long walks after we, you know, after we get home from work. But, <laughs> but still, you know, I think you still have the opportunity. If you want to go pursue something, now the opportunities are there to make it a lot easier. Or on your laptop, what the hell? I can spin up, you know, huge things on my laptop that are great. So you have the opportunity to get some mastery. And the fun thing about this is later on, when you're at work someday, and somebody says, well, I don't know what we're going to do. Where are we going to get more machines? What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? You can say, oh, you know that EC2 thing? Well, I just did it, and it's going to cost you this much, and it's so easy, and I already know it. And that will put you in a different place in your workplace. And the other thing I want to say is for purpose, for teaching, um, uh, I think that one of the ways to help yourself get, even if you don't get a chance to find whatever your quote unquote calling is, or, your, or even what the organization's calling is, um, if you spend just a little bit of time teaching, and it doesn't really matter who and what, it could be in our subject or not, you find that that tends to change you in a little bit that gets you a little more oriented towards the bigger picture, in my experience, um, standing on this stage. Okay, and the other thing, here's another little tip for you from Bruce Vincent from the New West uh, Institute, another, um, uh, um, businessy sort of thing. Um, he says that if you want to change stuff at work, you should fo focus on the motivational middle. And what he means by that is he says there are three kinds of people uh, when it comes to certain projects uh, and things in a company. There are those who are committed, who are really up and want to do whatever it is you want them to do. There are the people that are compliant, who are willing to do what you want them to do. You know, like, but, you know, and, and they're willing to do it, and that's fine. And then there are the complacent ones, and I think he was just trying to be cute about the calm, calm, calm thing here. But the complacent ones, those people that are actively not for whatever project is or what you want to do. And his suggestion is you should focus. Most people, what they do is they go and they say, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on working with my little core group of the committed people. And then we'll, we'll branch out from there. But that actually doesn't really work in, if you do some institutional research nearly as well because you tend to isolate everybody else or you tend to uh, piss off other people. The place that he suggests you spend your time is with the compliant ones. Because usually the compliant ones are the largest group, if you can get the compliant ones working with you, and you've already got the committed people, congratulations, you have a majority, and you can make things go forward. And when you do that, you will also, be, you'll also give the complacent people no one else to complain to. Because they won't, you know, all the other people will be like, yeah, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're fine, we're doing it. So the, way to, the place to, to, uh, to push in your organization is the compliant ones. Okay, the other thing that I think is kind of cool is um, the ability to change your perception of the world and how you operate in the world. I know it sounds really vague. Um, once upon a time, I realized very clearly that this, my, as far as I could tell, my job as a sysadmin was most closely aligned to this game here. Um, this game here. Okay, how many people know what Flux is? How many people don't know what Flux is? Okay, good. So let me tell you about Flux. Flux is a, Flux is a cool game. It's, it's one of a form of games that started with a game called Gnomic, I believe. Um, and the goal of this game is, and I'm not going to pull out the cards, but I can. If you, you can come take a look at it if you later. The thing is, it's a game where some of the cards in the game have goal cards. And they change what the goal is of that game. So you pull, you know, you, you've got a card, you got a card, you pull another card that says, really, t to win your game, you have to get three reds. I'm making this stuff up. You can get as creative as you want about this. And you play that one, and you, so you try to get three reds, and then you pull another card, and that card says, the way to, the way to, get, to win the game is to get, make sure you don't, you don't have three reds. Okay? Or, and so I think of system administration often very similar to this, where congratulations, on a fairly regular basis, somebody hands me a new goal card. You know, and for those of you out there who said, congratulations, you're now a cloud provider, you're like, <laughs> right, you know exactly what I mean. 
So to my mind, this is kind of what I think of like as, as a, way, a, a way of thinking about this, um, using games. And so I wound up reading this book, and I thought I was going to hate this book, by Jay McGonigal. It is another tremendously fabulous book that changed my, my thinking about the world. Um, she is trying to suggest that there are many ways that we can use what we've learned from games to improve our lives, to make reality better. If you can change how you think about stuff and how you perceive the world, you can do that. And so she comes up with, so they're really, so I'm going to give you bad, you know, small examples, not bad examples, but small ones. I'm actually going to give you a small demo of something just because I think you'd find it fun um, that will show you what she means. And there's a whole bunch, it's just a great book. Um, one of the things in there is, is there, you know, you can create a game, like let's say at home you're having problems with your spouse and you and your family actually getting stuff done in housework. Well, she has a game that you can play called Chore Wars. Okay, and that game, you know, you have to compete with your other with your, with the other people to get stuff done in your house. And try that once, and guarantee you it works. Okay, another one, you know. So there are other ones uh, out there. I'm going to show you. I thought it'd be fun, um, just for fun. Let's click to this and see if this works. So here's another game that I want to show you. You know, you can't really see that one, but this one you'll be able to see. I see. This is not actually. This is just a, a poster to hold up while, while we get this one coming. La, la, la. I would feel really good if you would be. You want me to A, right? There we go. Okay, so there's this really game. And can you take the, take the iPhone volume up, please? Are you ready for me? Okay. Yes, thank you. So this is called Epic Win. And I'm sorry, I'm not actually hearing the sound that I really wanted to get out of it. But Epic Win is a really good game, and let me actually go to the settings so you can sort of see where I want, what I want to show you. There we go, now I hear it. Sorry. So Epic Win is this really game where you get to be an avatar. And so you can be uh, this dwarf, which is short stature, long beard, which I, maybe that's the one you're most like to pick, I don't know. Uh, I, I wouldn't understand that at all. Um, you know, uh, sporty multitasker, work to the bone, skelly, and I would, I'm going to pick uh, the most closely aligned one, the beef and muscle one, if that's okay with you. Um, so here I am, picking this sort of thing. We wait for a couple of seconds. Go, go, go. And lo and behold, um, you can enter in your own tasks, okay? Do backups. Um, do your paperwork. Um, pick anything else, you know, like actually, you know, rewrite that code. Etc. Put in whatever you want for a task, okay? And as you do it, um, you can check these off. Let's see if these. Yeah, you can't really hear them as well as I'd like them to. Like them to. So I can delete them and I can add them. So the basic idea is you can see these chores. You can set. You can sort of set what they are. There's an alarm. And as you do your chores, strangely enough, you get points. You get gold. Um, you know, you're you're actually acting. Let's see if I can show. Um, yeah, here's. You know, you get status. All this other good sort of stuff. So you can put in whatever you want, sys as many as you want, and I highly recommend you do it. And as you do stuff, you get a chance to check it off, and you feel really good about it. And it's like a game. And the more you get it, you get gold, you get rewards, you get all sorts of good stuff like that. And they call it level up your life. Okay? So you can, might imagine that if you, this changes your perception of having to do backups. Oh, cool, I can do backups now because I'm going to get that gold and stuff like that. So it's another way of sort of messing, messing with your life. And I'm going to show you one more small thing on, 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 along the side. So we're going to take, take us out of that. You can check this out if you want. It's an iPhone game. There are other ones. Um, and the last thing I want to say along these lines is sometimes you can do little things. And um, here's an example of one little thing that you can do in your life that might make you happier. So Brandon Keeper came up with this notion of putting this in his get commit hook. I'm now speaking to systems here. Okay. So what that does is that plays um, this um, sound file, which I'm hoping my computer is up. Yes? Okay, here's open. It's not. I know, is that cool? It's kind of silent. You guys up on, up on, uh, hey, Rod? Oops. Well, then we'll go back and play it, sorry. It's only cool when it's up. So every time Brandon Keeper commits something to his Git repository, it plays this. And he says, and there's other suggestions in this blog post, you can go find it on collectiveidea.com slash blog, that that tremendously changes his life and his desire to commit stuff. Okay? And I've heard of people doing things like that, having happy pastors and stuff like that. Excellent. Good to see you, Mad Dog. I'll be done in five minutes and we'll be cool. 30 seconds. Yeah, I'll be done in 30 seconds. So here, 
Excellent. If I didn't have Josh, I don't know what I would do. Um, so here is some of the books that I would point to you if you want to start sort of at the top and then do what I did, which is sort of chase, chase all of the um, research that's in these sort of things. Um, by Dan Ariely, Carol Dweck, you've heard me talk about. There's a great book. Stuff like that. You can see this. This talk will be online, and so will these slides, so you get a chance to see it. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of my talk. I hope that you're just a little bit more copacetic as a result. And that's my talk. Thank you.